Ladies and gentlemen, there is no doubt in this case that the defendant committed these crimes. The question is whether or not you believe that his actions were legally justified. And I submit to you that no reasonable person would have done what the defendant did. And that makes your decision easy. He is guilty of all counts. Thank you. Good evening, black people and all allies fighting for black liberation, black prosperity, and black joy. I'm Charles Blow, and welcome to Prime. Today, before closing arguments in the murder trial of Kyle Rittenhouse, the judge dismissed misdemeanor charges for possession of a dangerous weapon by a person under the age of 18. Prosecutors conceded that the AR-15 Rittenhouse possessed was not short-barreled, therefore meeting legal requirements for possession in the state of Wisconsin. The dismissed charge was a blow to the prosecution as it may have been one of Rittenhouse's six charges most likely to yield a conviction. Rittenhouse still faces five felony counts related to the shooting that left two dead and one critically injured on August 15th of last year. Despite firing his weapon during the unrest, Rittenhouse's defense argued that he should not have been classified as an active shooter during closing arguments. Ladies and gentlemen, Kyle was not an active shooter. That is a buzzword that the state wants to lash onto because it excuses the actions of that mob on the 25th of 2020. The defense also argued that he feared for his life on the third night of the Kenosha demonstrations, which led him to fire his AR-15 in self-defense. During the prosecution's closing arguments, the lead prosecutor rebuked that claim, arguing that Rittenhouse forfeited his right to self-defense by threatening the victims before shooting. When the defendant provokes the incident, he loses the right to self-defense. You cannot claim self-defense against a danger you create. That's critical right here. Rittenhouse's fate will be determined by a jury, 12 of whom were chosen from an 18-member pool. The other six jurors will serve as alternates if needed. As a precautionary measure, the governor of Wisconsin has deployed 500 National Guard troops to be on standby in the event of unrest following the verdict. Joining us to discuss is chairwoman of the Rainbow Push Coalition, Ms. Tricia C.K. Hoffler, and former prosecutor, Charles Coleman. Ms. Hoffler, I just want to get your opinion of the trial now that we have the closing arguments on the merits. How do you see this trial uh, play, uh, playing out? Well, first of all, good evening. I thought that throughout the course of the trial, the prosecution really did not put together a clean, simple case. There was a lot of confusion, and in a criminal trial, the prosecution bears the burden of proof. So I felt that in laying the evidence and proving its case, the prosecution failed to really give the jury a sense of what the themes were, how the evidence is going to be laid. And some of the witnesses that they put on had evidence, actually, that, that helped the other side. However, in closing, the prosecution drove it home. They had a beginning, a middle, and end. The prosecutor was absolutely very strong in his presentation. He was able to re re rebuke, basically, and refute all of the elements of the, uh, the aspects of self-defense that he was anticipating that the defense was going to put up. He was able to basically annihilate, um, in my impression, the testimony of Cal Rittenhouse. The problem is, it happens in closing, during closing arguments. And I think that the defense did a masterful job in the course of the trial itself in poking holes and creating reasonable doubt in the prosecution's case. There was all of this confusion, quite frankly, during the case in chief, but the prosecution explained it, had a beginning, middle, and end during closing, and left us with a sense of, I get it now. It's just a little late, mm -hmm. but at least they did it in closing for the jury right. and connected the dots. So I think right. that... Mr. Coleman, um, do you agree with that assessment? Oh, oh well, sorry, Charles I didn't mean to cut CK you off, but I, I wanted to get, get Mr. Coleman in to see if he agrees. Sure. CK and I have had conversations about this trial earlier in the week, and it happened most notably right after Kyle Rittenhouse had testified himself on the stand and was cross-examined by the prosecution. And what we agreed at that point then 
uh, that she sort of reinforced now that I still agree with, which was the, the prosecution's case was technically sound. From what it is to try a case as a prosecutor and what it is that you need to accomplish in terms of being able to get out the legal elements in order to prove your case, the prosecution did what it could with what it had. Now, for style points and in terms of its approach, I agree with CK. It was boring in a lot of ways, and it didn't necessarily do what it needs to do in front of the jury. And the reason that I say that, I'm not casting, I'm not making light of what it is to try a case. I'm saying that when you are trying a jury trial, you have to understand that you are appealing to 12 different people, 12 or more different people, because you also have alternates. You're appealing to 12 or more different people who are total strangers. Not only are you intending to put, present your version of the facts to them, but you have to do it in a way that tells a compelling story. And while they did elicit some of the individual pieces that are necessary to establish the elements that they need to secure a conviction, I don't know that they were able to, until today, blend that together in a manner that was compelling and got the jury's interest. I think it was a technically sound uh, case that was put forward by the prosecution, but I also think that there were a number of witnesses that the prosecution put on that hurt their case more than they helped their case. And Kyle Rittenhouse, as sort of the star witness for the defense, was very, very solid in terms of how he was prepared and how he handled the cross-examination in front of the jury. So all of those things are going to be interesting now that the jury has seen both of the summations, they've gotten the jury instructions, right. and they have the case for deliberation. Ms. Hoffman, you said that, that you thought that the prosecution kind of destroyed the self-defense argument in closing, even if not, they didn't do it in the trial. How do you see that playing out? I mean, the self-defense is the central defense in this case. Well, I think um, they did as good a job as they could in closing and just annihilating or picking apart that self-defense because basically Kyle Rittenhouse injected himself. He provoked this entire story. And that's why there's got to be, I agree with Charles, they've got to tell a story. He started the story. The story didn't start and he just injected himself. He started the story. He is the one who set in motion this deadly rampage, really, that resulted in the death of two and the injury of one and endangering others. And I think that in closing, the prosecution was able to, for the first time, in my impression, show how the, the um, defense of self-defense has very strong legal and factual holes. And that's the first time that I saw that. I did not see that at all in the course of the trial and in the course of the case in chief. And so it may have been a little late to do that, but they came with that during closing. And I think that that's going to resonate with the jury. Will it be enough? I'm not sure, because there was a lot of chaos that remains in the case that the defense managed to preserve. And they introduced that chaos early on. The videos, in some respects, from the prosecution standpoint, the video clips that they used clarified that self-defense was not really what happened, that Kyle, he was the provocateur. He provoked this, and he should not be able to then use self-defense when he started this, when he's the reason for this happening. I think that will resonate with the jurors. When the, when the prosecution talked about when you have a fist fight, you don't need to bring an AR-15 to a fist fight. You don't need to bring that deadly weapon. I think that can resonate with the folks on the jury. Um, again, is it enough to overcome all of the other stuff? Um, I'm not so sure because it's coming at the 11th hour in closing. I would have loved to have seen all of those themes being built earlier in the prosecution's case, no matter what the defense put on, no matter what the cross-examination is, because the prosecutor has the burden of proof. They've got to lay it out for that jury early on. You can't wait till the end to do that. You've got to do it consistently from the inception, because primacy is key. When you're a trial lawyer, when you're the first one out of the box, you have the ability to tell the story in your way, regardless of what the defense does in cross-examination. And that didn't happen. It didn't, right. co it didn't gel together until the end. Mr. Coleman, you know, one of the things that's interesting about this trial is the presentation of the defendant, Kyle Rittenhouse, himself. 
the, not only was it you know much talked about taking of the stand, and actually, I, you know, I think I agree with Ms. Hoffer doing a pretty good job of answering the questions, but also the rendering of him as a child, even though he's an adult. I mean, I, I have to remind myself and everyone else who I talk to about this case that there are people his age in the military, right? There, there are people his age fighting for the country. Uh, this is not a child. Uh, and, you know, everything about him, though, in the presentation is to render him a child. I was noticing today, like, the, the inappropriately tied tie, like a, like a little boy would tie. Like, every little thing to me was signaling that the jury would see him as a boy, which is very much stands in contrast to the way that black boys, real boys, are treated as adults and seen as adults and more adult than they are. Talk to us about his presentation and how that may impact the jury, you know, in a society in which we live. Well, Charles, I think you hit the nail right on the head. This is a point that I've been making uh, on a number of different platforms. I made it on Twitter and I talked earlier about the fact that the infantilization of Kyle Rittenhouse is a very intentional tactic to exploit what he enjoys in terms of the protection of what we know is the difference between how young white males in America are viewed as compared to black and Latino males who are oftentimes viewed as either one to as many as three years older than they are during their teenage years. That, of course, leads to a number of different types of interactions with law enforcement. It leads to different interactions in academic settings, and it can absolutely lead to different interactions and different outcomes in the criminal justice system. It was to Kyle Rittenhouse's benefit when I heard one of the victims themselves describe Kyle Rittenhouse and what they saw from him as it was like a child who had gotten caught doing something wrong. This consistent infantilization of Kyle Rittenhouse has has only shielded him in a lot of ways from things that people of other races would not have the benefit of doing. I want to make viewers aware of something and bring them to a point that I think is of critical import. When Trayvon Martin was killed in Florida, he was 17 years of age, the same age that Kyle Rittenhouse was when he went to Kenosha, uh, Wisconsin, with an AR-15 and shot and killed two people. When that conversation happened, the national convert, the national dialogue around Trayvon Martin was about whether he should have had a hoodie on, whether he had smoked, whether he had smoked marijuana before, whether he had spoken ill of or used racial epithets to describe white people, what his grades were like. This was the conversation about the victim who was the same age, the Central Park Five. When they were the exonerated five, rather, when they were on the stand, these were teenage black males in New York City, not older than Kyle Rittenhouse was, many of them younger. Their tears on the stand did not matter to that jury. They did not matter to the media. And so I think you are absolutely right in pointing out the difference and stark contrast in terms of what we see around how Kyle Rittenhouse is being viewed and how he and his counsel are intentionally exploiting that so that they may be able to connect with the jury and draw some sympathy. It's very important to remember the jury does mm -hmm. not need to unanimously right. acquit Kyle Rittenhouse. They simply need one or two people who are going to refuse to convict and Kyle Rittenhouse walks free. So all of what you've identified contributes to that and supports that theory of the case. Charles Coleman and CJ Hoffler, thank you so much for joining me tonight. I really appreciate your time.